Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Derrick, and alongside me, for what feels like the first time in forever, the Jotun Toten, vault dwelling, nightmare fueling, the the ghost to my guardian, the the Mithrax to my saint, Josh Finney. Oh, it's good to be back, man. Uh, I I'm glad you're here, Josh. I'm, I am I'm, too. I, I missed it, you. I man, I missed you too. It, it really has been a while. We've, we've done three episodes without each other. I know. It feels like uh, I did. The, I did the raid recap with uh, with with Dealer. Yeah. And then I did an episode with Nerd without you. Yeah. And then uh, I had to unexpectedly take last week off. Um, but I'm back. Um, I w- truthfully, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it back today, but uh, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Well, look, Josh. I'm glad you're here. You, I think, I think the uh, Tower Casuals community can all agree that you are the uh, the heart and soul of the show. And uh, don't get me wrong. I love nerd. I love you, nerd. I love you. We love you. Big heart. But uh, when you when you leave the show, there's a big hole to fill. So. Yeah, you know. and uh, you know, I've spoken a lot since we started this almost almost three years ago, man. Almost three years. In yeah. June, it'll be three years. Isn't that um, nuts? That's wild. We were talking about uh, Beyond Light coming to Game Pass. <laughs> or like, or, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, dude, Beyond Light we, coming to Game Pass. We, yeah, we brought it, we kind of threw it together the week that uh, Arrivals came out. Yeah. Because that was, that was, I think, the catalyst for, uh, you know, you jumping back in full time. Yeah was uh, right around arrivals, you know, because the seasons were kind of weak. But uh, I've talked a lot about how, like, this really helped, you know, keep me grounded with everything going on the last couple of years. And that uh, it was very weird not being on last week. But there was just there was no way I was going to be able yeah, to sit no, here I, and talk I don't think... about Destiny for a few hours. Yeah, I don't think the people that know who expected you to be there, if I would have no. not let you come on, <laughs> to be honest with you. No, uh, and um, frank, frankly, I needed somebody to step in. You almost said a few weeks ago, um, and I probably should have let you, but it was uh, right after Lightfall's launch. There was no way I was going to miss it. Um, for those of you who do not know, um, just the long and the short of it, um, I think everybody who listens to this show at any point knows that uh, pretty much my full-time job is taking care of my mom, uh, her primary caregiver, getting her to appointments, uh, handling a lot of her finances, a lot of her medical decisions, things like that. Um, she has had terminal lung cancer uh, since October. I found out about mid-October. Um, and then she passed away uh, last Tuesday evening. So um, I was not in any condition to do a show 36 hours later. Um, thankfully, uh, Nerd and Andre stepped in. Uh, but I'm back this week to try and get a little bit of normalcy back to my life um, while I kind of figure out, you know, the last bits of what I, what I have to do there. Uh, thankfully, you know, a lot of people have stepped in to help me uh, a lot of the family has stepped up and, uh, you know, just thanks to everybody who, you know, reached out to me. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably saw me have a, uh, minor breakdown, um, via social media, um, hashtag fuck cancer. Um, unironically though, really fuck cancer. Um, but, uh, you know, nerd Andre, uh, Joasis Fox, uh, dealer saint you know a lot of y'all were reaching out to me uh seeing how i was doing and i've been checking in on me uh, almost daily in some cases i really appreciate it of course you know corey has been keeping tabs on me making sure i'm taking care of myself um but if nobody else is my friends are making sure i'm taking care of myself um but that, that was very hard um that was uh maybe you know should we we knew it was going to happen uh about 48 hours after we heard about lance's passing so uh, it's it's been a rather you know emotional couple of weeks uh, yeah. around the apartment. I'm sure the uh, story beats in Destiny, although fictional characters <laughs> didn't really. It's been pretty. It's been, it's been pretty rough, man. Um, I was essentially adopted by my grandparents. Uh, my dad is in the picture, but he was deployed for most of my childhood um, in the Middle East, and so um, yeah, my grandma and grandpa raised me. Um, I became friends with Corey about a year and a half after my grandpa passed. Um, Destiny is part of what got me through the grieving process. And then, uh, you know, here we are 10 years later, you know, I bookended my 20s like this. So uh, it's been it's been really difficult. Um, as far as I'm concerned, those are my parents. 
and especially the Zavala story beats uh, with Amanda have really been hitting home for me. Um, to have a viewing to go to on Saturday. Uh, not you know not going to bring the mood down anymore, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been it's been a little emotional to try and get through uh, some of the story beats lately. Um, thankfully, the season is over. If the season wasn't over, um, or if we were going through like the beats and haunted, I probably would be stepping away for a while from storylines. Uh, but I'm here. I'm back. Um, I want to say a little bit about Lance too before we got started. Uh, given given the story beats this week, which caps off probably the, the second most emotional Zavala story we've ever gotten um, after Haunted when we get his his full backstory for the first time. Um, you know, first of all, th- thankfully Lance was able to bring both of these scenes to life. Yeah. Um, you know, and. Bungie's come out and said, you know, they're going to continue his story. They they came out and clarified it this week um, in case, you know, people missed the clarification last week. Um, they have enough dialogue um, for this year, essentially. Um, my impression is they'll probably be able to rework some dialogue, kind of like they did with Carrie Fisher in uh, the ninth Star Wars movie, uh-huh. um, for Lance to let him be a part of the final shape. Um, and, you know, there there's a time and a place later on to, you know, for us to debate after some more story beats maybe of what happens with Zavala. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, like, I, I mean, I mentioned on last week's yeah. show, like we do want to talk about the p- possibilities of Zavala as a character, but now it's not the time no. because it's, it's not, it's, it's just not the time. Um, it was really, uh, you know, I, I kind of had the same reaction. Nerd and I were kind of having the same reaction in real time, uh, being in the tower, uh, with a lot of other guardians, um, and, you know, Lance is somebody that for, God, since I was like 16 has probably been, 15, 16 has been a part of pop culture for me. Um, I was a huge mm-hmm. fan of Fringe and Lost back in the day. Um, you know, of course, oh, he yeah, was one I of forgot the, he was in Lost. He was one of the but... leads on Fringe. In fact, um, he was supposed to have a much bigger role in Lost and uh, asked to be written out because J.J. Abrams, uh, who also was an EP on Lost, liked him so much in that that he was like, hey, would you like to do your role from the wire, but in a paranormal setting? And uh, that's how he became Detective Broyles in uh, Fringe. So that was really cool to see. Um, you know, of course, anybody who knows me knows I'm a huge fan of Remedy Games. I love Quantum Break. Uh, he, you know, did an awesome job in Quantum Break. Um, yeah. We talked about Horizon last week, he, too. Uh, yeah, Horizon. Yeah, I, I've never played a ton of Horizon, but I know that he's huge as Silence in that in that series. Yeah. Um, so I imagine that uh, the Burning Wilds DLC is going to be really... Uh, that's going to be really emotional for a lot of people. Um, yeah. You it's, know... Uh, that's... that. I mean, not to, like, really get into it, but I yeah. think... I think uh, Gorilla is going to have a harder time figuring out to do with his mm-hmm. character than destiny is because that that's what i've heard um i very much you know see them continuing to use his likeness though if nothing else yeah um you know of course a lot of a lot of modern audiences know him uh, as part of the john wick series um but for all of us listening to the show he's always going to be he's good he's going to be two roles he's going to be commander zavala and he's going to be um Oh my god! I just I've been rewatching The Wire and I just forgot his name. Holy shit! The I wire. can't believe I actually forgot his name on The Wire. He Daniels, The Wire, Major Daniels. Holy shit! I cannot believe I actually forgot uh, his name temporarily. I kept try I kept trying to say Broyles. <laughs> uh, no, that's him. That's him in French. Um, you know, I, so many of the clips I was seeing shared of his work were Destiny clips uh, for his voiceovers or wire clips you know that that was really the big breakout that he had mm-hmm. um and i think going back and seeing you know some of these scenes play out you know it's just crazy how when you watch him on the screen or when he's in something even if he's not like the lead actor he just like instantly like his presence just takes over the room like he's that he's that good at his delivery and his body language and his mannerisms. Like he is that good. Yeah. Um, so his loss is definitely going to be felt beyond beyond the Destiny community. Um, he he was one of the highlights of anything he was in. I mean, the Resident Evil series on Netflix is ass, but he's great. Yeah. He was great as Wesker. Yeah. So you know, gi- gigantic loss. Um, and I think it's a testament to how much. He loved the community also. Um, his wife put out a statement the day after 
And I was actually really, I don't usually get like touched by statements from like reps of celebrities or from their families, but there was a whole, it was a three paragraph statement. And the second paragraph is just about the destiny community. Yeah. About how, you know, her and the family had seen, you know, our tributes in the tower and, you know, videos and fan art that was being done. And uh, she basically said, you know, he, he loved you guys as, uh, you know, he loved the community as much as he loved the game and as much as you guys loved him. And that, I don't think there's anything more special you can say about a community of people than, hey, my husband just passed away, but y'all should know, like, he, like, he fucking loved y'all. Mm-hmm. He he loved this game, and, uh, you know, his Bungie ID was, uh, I know y'all talked about this last week, his Bungie ID was, uh, was figured out, and uh, he had been playing the campaign the night before and hadn't finished uh, Desperate Measures. So I saw uh, a bunch of people going in with two man fire teams. Um, saying they were getting the completion for uh, for the commander. Yeah, I saw um, that too. That was uh... just uh, some some really touching tributes, some awesome fan art, um, you know, dialogue dialogue videos. Um, uh, my girlfriend and I definitely pulled up and listened to the uh, the speech from the beginning of uh, Cerberus Va. Um, the the copy pasta that we all know mm-hmm. very well. Um, mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's 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 gonna hurt, and I think any time that we get Zavala dialogue for the next couple of seasons, it's gonna be like, oh shit, you know. Um, I I don't I don't know what else to say. What 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 a giant, what yeah. an absolute giant, uh, a huge presence yeah. that I think we're all gonna miss. So yeah, yeah, it's uh it's gonna be uh, it. This, this is gonna hurt for a little bit. I'm I'm like you said earlier. I'm glad the season's kind of over because, yeah. I don't know. Even when I go up to even the last week or so, when I was running up to do like my strikes or whatever for the week or grab bounties or something, and he would just say his you know typical vanguard stuff. It, it hit a little bit harder <laughs> the last week and a half. So, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna miss him. And we're we're gonna miss him. So, uh, Lance, we'll see you star side. Keep yeah. uh, keep the engines warm for us. Yeah. Uh, also, like I said um, last week, we don't really we don't really promote our merch store or anything. But anything that's purchased there is we're donating to his the the mom's care charity that he was a part of. Uh, yes. So yes. Everything over the next month or two that we make is going there. So, um, yeah. Unfortunately, Corey, we do have some destiny we have to talk about. We do. We do have. We actually have real destiny to talk about. We have real destiny to talk about. Let's uh, let's hit this crucible blog from last week real quick. I know you guys covered parts of it. Yeah, we covered it very lightly, as we mentioned uh, <laughs> last week. Uh, we were going to wait for Josh or someone, you know, who really likes the numbers and the granular stuff of crucible to, to break it down. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to break down, um, break down what I can. Um, a lot of this is stuff that's going to come in the mid season patch or is going to, uh, come at the beginning of season 21 or even in the future. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to bring some of this up. Um, first is the, uh, the map modes or the maps that'll be weighted. Um, you're more likely to play on javelin Four, burnout, rust of the lands, Midtown and Wormhaven. There's a bunch in standard weight. Not going to read that. They've reduced the weight, though. Less likely to play on for um, Disjunction, Cathedral Dusk, uh, Twilight Gap, and uh, Dead Cliffs for Clash. Um, and then not in the playlist uh, are going to be Exodus Blue and uh, Convergence. And, you know, just thank fucking God. I wish we could put Eternity. I wish we could put Eternity in that list, too. Um, but some upcoming changes. Um, the mid-season patch. Clash is going to leave the quick play playlist, so it'll only be control. It'll go back to its name. It won't be called quick play anymore. Um, and it'll be replaced by Iron Banner when that's up. Of course, loose skill-based matchmaking, but they're going to make some changes to that as well. Um, skill and connection filters are going to be modified, uh, so your latency, win- latency windows are expanded at slower rates. Um, it's not mean you will never see lag in the Crucible, um, but it should help reduce all of that and keep people closer to your skill. Um, the current rotator will be split into two playlists, uh, the relentless and the party rotators. Uh, these are all connection based too. These modes will all be connection based as of the, uh, update to the playlists, uh, with the mid season patch. We don't quite know when that's coming. I think that's coming in the next week or two. Um, but 
The Relentless Rotator is going to have Clash, Rift, and Zone Control, uh, and will be seen as a main haven for players who want to engage with large team-based play, gameplay outside of skill-based matchmaking, and having it will always make sure there is conventional team-based Destiny PvP available to play when Iron Banner is active. Um, and it will be replaced by Trials when Trials is live uh, on weekends, just so you know. And then the Party Rotator is Mayhem, Scorched, Momentum Control. This is the one I'm really excited about. Uh, these are modes that significantly modify the general sandbox of Destiny and play very differently than normal Crucible. All remaining freelance nodes have been removed with Fireteam matchmaking in place. So there are there will be no more freelance nodes at all. No more. Oh. It's done. It's over with. Um, I do want to know if this... Um, <clears throat> I want to know if this is going to apply to Iron Banner as well, because that's... Uh, I think Iron Banner may already have it out. I don't remember off the top of my head. And I can't pull up Iron Banner to check. Um, but I will say, I think that not having Freelance did work really well in Trials last week. Yeah, I actually I, had a really good time in Trials. Yeah, I don't remember seeing Freelance in... <laughs> Until it was Immortal Spam, I had a really good time with Trials. <laughs> uh, then it became Immortal, the game mode. Um, yeah. It'll fire, team ma- fire Team Matchmaking, we've talked about this stuff before. Um, there is... Okay, yeah, Freelance was completely removed from Iron Banner uh, in January. So, yeah. Okay, that's that's already been done. That's been gone for a long time. That's why I don't remember it. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of numbers here. I'm not going to go through the numbers. Um... The numbers. Yeah, dude, not going through all this. Um, there, There's some stuff in here about comp. There's a bunch of graphs. You guys can, again, you guys can go read these. Um, you know, there's not a huge, uh, huge thing. Um, <laughs> I did like this. Uh, medium to low skill, but all the way up in Ascendant or Adept ranks. We were happy to, these players called themselves out to us because we immediately knew there was either a serious bug or something very fishy was going on investigated individual mash history and in- issued permanent bans for win trading. So mm-hmm. win trading is a bannable offense. That's Ooh. actually really funny to me. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, there's, there's some definitions in here, um, such as smurfing, uh, which is a high skill veteran player creating a new account purely to play against lower skilled or newer players who they can mop the floor with. This leads to mismatched mm-hmm. games and drives newer players away from the game. This is possible I, now. The skill system picks up on smurfing quickly and moves smurf accounts to the proper skill pool. I don't, I don't, I don't understand why you would do that. Videos. Why would you create it? Why would you create a new account though? I dude, I have no because it's a free to play game. Honestly, I know, but like you don't have any of your gear, your your weapons, your you don't have anything, dude. I don't know. And then I, tanking. High skill player intentionally losing a number of games in a row so they can derank and play against lower skill players so they can mop the floor with. Once the skill system understands where they sit, it can be very time consuming to convince that they are much worse than they are when tanking and will quickly bring them back up to their former skill once they start playing again. <clears throat> and then they uh, they talk about how skill is determined. Um, there, man, there's there's a lot here. It's very technical. Um, I definitely recommend you guys read this if you are uh, questioning how comp works. Um, I would recommend you go read this. It's not necessarily technical, but I think if you play Destiny for any amount of time, you probably understand how a lot of this works, or if you played any sort of competitive FPS. The rewards. This, this is where I want to go in on. The rewards. Josh the is reward. all about the rewards. I'm all about the rewards. It's it's been my biggest complaint for the longest time. That and maps, and I can't I cannot talk anymore about maps. I'm so tired of complaining about crucible maps. What do I get for playing in this highly competitive playlist? Currently, you get an increasing Crucible rank multiplier based on your current division, which works in all playlists. Get one roll of the Rose Hand Cannon each week per character for participating. Find out where you stand among the rest of the Destiny PvP community. That's some bullshit. They actually say that that's a reward. Find out where you stand among the community. <laughs> Earn the Glorious Seal by reaching Platinum or Guild it by reaching Adept, as well as a number of other Crucible-related triumphs. One large note, at the start of Season 20, we shipped a bug where players could gain Glorious or Dredgen titles without completing all of the intended triumphs. In our mid-season patch, Glorious and Dredgen seal and guild claims will be reverted and the errant triumphs removed. Any players who have completed all of the intended triumphs will immediately be able to reclaim their seal or guild. Any players who were only able to claim based on mistakenly included triumphs will need to complete the regular triumphs to reclaim. Veteran players with multiple guilds of Dredgen will maintain their guild counts through this change. You best believe I ordered that fucking seal. I absolutely bought my glorious seal because I did get it errantly. 
It's not that hard of a seal to get. You, ha you have to hit platinum. That's the hardest thing to do. That's the hardest thing to do with this thing. And I don't think that that's like too, too hard. Like, I mean, I did my, I did my placement matches and I still, I placed gold three and I think I lost a match or two. So I felt pretty good about that. Um, we want competitive division to have more rewards to chase for our most dedicated PVP players. And when we introduced the system in season 19, we promised more information. With the mid-season patch in Season 20, Shax will have a new emblem for you. If you are Ascendant 3 or higher, there will be a stat tracker that allows you to put your current comp division rank number on PvP emblems. This emblem is sick. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I love this emblem, and I love knowing that I will never be able to earn this. And that's okay, because I think there need to be things that are not just handouts. Yeah. Um, it, it is cool, though. I mean, like... Yeah. Well, just... It's it's super cool. I'm good with there not being weapon rewards in comp, but I think that we need to get to a point. Uh, I, I'll do this after we talk about the season 21. At the start of season 21, the Rose Hand Cannon will be replaced by a new competitive division only sniper for participation in the playlist. We plan to add new weapons to the comp division every other season, and Rose will be again in a future season, but will be unobtainable during season 21, season of the deep. Lord Shax will have a new Season 21 Ascendant Emblem. We're adding a new emblem and retiring the previous one each season. That adds, I think, a prestige factor to it for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, especially this first, I would say this first one especially. Oh, yeah. And then Shax will have a Transmat effect for all players who reach Silver 3 or above. Not only is this Transmat the first one you can earn directly through gameplay, it also uses new text so it changes its appearance based on your current competitive division ranking. I think this is really cool. It's yeah, something it small, cool. but I think it's cool. In terms of like future rewards, though, like I, I do like that there are. So I, I, I should clarify my thoughts on weapons. I am fine with how Rose and the sniper will be handled. I'm totally fine with that. What I don't want is another not forgotten situation, or Luna's Howl, where you only got that from being like the pinnacle of PvP. Because I think that at that point, if the weapon isn't like the best, the best, you have people complaining. But if it's too OP, you have the rest of your player base complaining. Right. I think what would be cool is what if we got ornaments for the competitive guns? So like there was a rose ornament or there was a uh, ornament for the sniper rifle and it maybe the look of it can evolve based on the final ranking you have at the end of the or the highest ranking you get in a season, for example. Kind of like how Revision Zero's ornaments change the look of it each week. You know yeah. what, what do you think? What do you think about something like that? Oh, I think it's cool. I, think. I I I want I want stuff like that. I want to be able to show yeah. off the prestige of it, but I want it to be something that everybody can work towards. Yeah, I no, I think I, that would be cool. Yeah, I think this is I think this is cool. I think this is cool. I I, I like the prestige factor of it, especially if they're going to retire it every season, mm -hmm. and like you bring something new in, whether whether it's an emblem or an ornament or. Uh, you know, something of that nature or glow even at some point. Like, yeah, I, I think all these things are good. I'd rather have this than another ship or sparrow or ghost oh. shell that I'm just going to get rid of. Like, right. I think the I, emblems are a prestige factor. Yeah. If I get another ghost shell or a sparrow, I'm going to cry. Yeah. Seriously. I, I think these, I think these are all good. I, I like these. I like these ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there needs there needs to be just a little bit more. And part of me wonders if we're just getting like the bare minimum because they know that they're going to move off of this game in the next like 18 months. Right. Um, you know, I don't want to spread any like crazy conspiracy theories, but that's kind of where I'm at at this point with yeah. how long it took us just to get here. Um, I feel like that's got to kind of be in the back of everybody's mind. Yeah, no, I I a hundred percent agree with you, Josh. I think I think they don't, you know. I mean, between like the not even just the crucible stuff, but just like this kind of stuff. The more and more I've been thinking about it, the more and more the final shape seems like the final bow on Destiny Two. Yeah, I, it has to be. It has to be at this point. The game is chugging in some areas. Yeah. It's really chill. I cannot imagine still playing that. Shout shout out to the folks still playing on uh, launch day Xbox One or PS4. Oh Sh shouts to you, man. My nephew plays on Xbox One. Oof. I mean, he's ten, but you know, yeah, he's, like he doesn't know any better. But also, no. like, I feel so bad for him. Like a launch Xbox One, like a base Xbox One. I'm like, oh, dude. 
so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, competitive and crucible quality of life changes in future seasons regarding spawning uh, and lobby balancing. Uh, you, you guys can read that. It's kind of like more of the same that we've got. Um, Iron Banner. Um, some Iron Banner uh, details. Uh, it does not sound like we are going to get Rift back in Iron Banner for quite a while, which I think is welcome news for everybody that it was not included in the Iron Banner rotator this season. Thank God. Uh, ma- many of us love Rift in a fire team of experienced players. It c- is not as friendly to solo players, PvE players, or new players. We would like the feature when we feature a mode in Iron Banner. Expect an Iron Banner specific twist to address those factors in a future season, as well as new twists for cooking up as we speak. We're also looking at ways to decouple challenges for earn a daily reputation bonus from complete matches as specific subclasses to earn a pinnacle in Iron Banner, but we do not have a solution we're happy with yet. I hope you guys find one. <laughs> yeah. Because you were encouraging people to <laughs> run Strand, Stasis, and Void. Right. Which I get are the ones you're really focusing on this season, but holy shit. Uh, Fortress is going to be really fun in a few weeks. <laughs> Uh, trial trials tweaks fire team matchmaking already talked about that so trial out the trials labs on the schedule for season 20 will be using the labs following the mid-season patch to gather feedback on a new trials matchmaking system which will remove the flawless pool and ticket based matchmaking in favor of something different totally here for it love it absolutely love this uh summary of the goals for the new trials matchmaking system Allow players to play with friends without worrying about whether they've gone flawless. Remove motivation to reset cards in order to farm or carry. Better protect players who are struggling to find success in the playlist. How does the new matchmaking work? Here, This is really like the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to, what I wanted to talk about is this and the update to the passages. I'm very excited about all this. We'll have two always active soft pools. Soft means matchmaking initially prefers not to blend the pools, but will, if necessary, to find a good game quickly. Challenger Pool. This is where most players who currently play Trials on a week-to-week basis and who want to go flawless will play. It represents an experience more like the original iteration of Trials in D1 without the focus on making games more difficult as the card progresses or after you've been flawless. The pool matches based solely on connection. There is no matchmaking based on tickets, which is wins on ticket, wins, weekly wins, or skill. Players who have any card with no losses, including a card after a reset, or those playing with someone in their fire team that has a card with no losses will be placed in this pool. Then there's the practice pool. This is targeted at newer or less experienced players, players who are not yet ready to give going flawless a shot and represents a place for them to dip their toes into trials without being thrown straight into the deep end. It is based on connection and weekly performance, how well you've done in trials this week, and it resets every week. Only players with a flawed card or those on their first game of the week can play in this pool. Everyone in your fire team must have a flawed card or be on their first game of the week. It has stomp protection. If you are current, consistently struggling, it will reduce your weekly performance rating, give you slightly easier matches until you recover. And farming protection. If the system detects you or a fire team member are likely attempting to farm the practice pool, it will slow down your matchmaking, and if you continue, will lock you into the challenger pool for the remainder of the weekend, regardless of your card state. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's great. And I think when you couple that with what they're going to do in Season 21, because there is a Trials blog coming later this season, but what they're aiming to do in Season 21, I think that this makes a lot of sense. Updates the Passages. Wealth will reward extra Trials rank on every win. The amount rewarded increases as your major rank increases. And then Mercy will now forgive two losses if you have not been flawless for the week. Reverts to its old behavior of forgiving a single loss once you go flawless. Thank fucking God. Thank right. fucking God. Yeah, Because I think that a lot of people are going to love this. Yeah, I do too. I, two losses, I, I think, is really forgiving for those of us who we're just happy to get to it once. Right. Um, I think that's really forgiving for a lot of us. And then uh, yeah. changes to Gilded Flawless uh, requirements. We want to bring this more in line with Gilded Glorious and better reward dedication, along with individual and team skill and trials. A new Flawless emblem. Rewarded this emblem, and this is, this is another prestige thing, rewarded for going flawless without ever trailing in any of your wins. That's going to be wild to get. Man, that's crazy. That's the I best of the best. I want to know who's going to get that. Who in the Discord is going to get that first? Dealer. Well, he's just a look. He's just a freak. Okay. D- uh, D- dealer, a- dealer, Rex, Oak. Uh, some of those guys are at the top of my list for who I think will end up with this first. Oh my gosh. Um, experimenting nuts. with changing the main trials game mode to be zone capture elimination, which has been renamed Dominion, and a new introductory quest to better onboard players into the trials environment. I am absolutely here for this. I love it. I love it. I love all these changes to trials. I have I have fallen back in love with trials uh, over the last like season and a half. Mm-hmm. 
Um, part of that is due to the rewards. I think the reward, I think the, the guns have been really good the last couple of seasons. And I mean, especially this season, I think everybody wants to chase that immortal, obviously an astral horizon is no slouch either. Next season is going to have that new emblem. I also believe that's traditionally the season that we get new trials armor. You've got more people in there trying to play trials than ever now, not just because of immortal, but because the old armor and old weapons are back. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, so that's really rewarding. I finally got that fucking chest piece after so long, dude. I yeah. finally got it. I'm so happy. I'm so glad I burned three Ancrums on it. Th- <laughs> fucking thrilled. <laughs> fucking thrilled that I did it. Um, <laughs> it was it was totally worth it. That's three more immortals I can't get, but it was totally worth it. At least uh, it wasn't. At least it wasn't uh, the seven engrams. <laughs> Oh, dude, I listen, that's still, re- it really hurts that uh, I saved up seven Ingrams and I couldn't use them for anything. Oh, man. Because they changed the system. I went and turned them all in. I did get the Trials weapons I was missing from the last couple seasons. That was really nice. That's nice. I got that's the cool. LNG and the, I got the hand cannon, which I don't care about out of it. Um, you got it now. It's in your collections. You it, is in my, it. It, it is, it's in fact, there. in my collections. It's there. I, <laughs> I am missing uh, the two from this season, and that's it. In addition to the return of Meltdown PvP map in Season 21, next season, a new Vex Network map in Season 22, which, you know, if if you're keeping track at home, that is the same season that we are slated to get Wrath of the Machine back, assuming Wrath is the raid. And yeah. the Citadel's reprisal coming in Season 23, we're going to add several new and returning game modes to the Crucible rotation, starting with Countdown in Season 20. I think Countdown is already in the game as we speak. I think Countdown is actually in it. I think uh, I saw DMG tweeting about it earlier that he had played a match. Yeah. Um, maybe it was in a custom game, but I do believe it. I believe it is in the game right now. Uh, it is a reprise of Elim. Oh, go ahead. No, I was, I, all I said was it looks like it. I was yeah. looking it up. It's a reprise of the classic Destiny 2 elimination mode originally featured in Trials of the Nine. In Countdown, two teams go against one another in a single life battle for control of two Cabal charges. Paul charges on the map service focal points to force the combat and exist as team-based solution to the stalemate gameplay that existed in standard standard elim. Once charge is armed via interaction, it begins taking down its fuse, and defenders have 36, 35 seconds to defuse the charge before it detonates. I really like countdown. Um I uh, or uh, as it used to be called, Elim. Uh, mm-hmm. I really liked this mode. Um it was really fun playing this 4v4. Um or a version of it um, back when it used to be in the rotators a couple years ago. This was really fun. I think at one point, uh, A1 Johnny and I went on like a 10 game win streak in this mode. It was just, it was absolutely wild. Uh, and then you have Countdown Classic, uh, Elim Team, v- Team VT with a Cabal Charge as the focal point. This is what I'm thinking of. Once a charge exits via defusal or detonation, the round ends. Round also ends if a team is eliminated in the arm phase. In the defuse phase, a charge must be defused or defenders must be eliminated. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. I really like it. And the maps that it will be active on are Fortress, Radiant Cliffs, Pacifica, Midtown, Eternity, and Meltdown. Fucking Eternity. I fucking hate Eternity so much. Make it go away. Go, Josh, make, make it go away. Make it go away! It's so bad. Uh, countdown, respawn, same as standard countdown, but with no elim rules. Players respawn after seven seconds and can be resurrected immediately by another player. Spending their revive token. You have one revive token per round. Um, And then Countdown Rush. (laughs) Multiple Cabal charges per round. Same respawn and resurrection rules of Countdown Respawn. Uh, This is wild. When a charge exits play via detonation or defusal, the other unarmed charge reactivates and is available to be armed. Once both charges are out of play, the round ends and sides swap. So that could be really spicy. That also could, like, just take forever. Uh, Same maps. (laughs) And then... uh, the very last thing here, Checkmate. Looking forward, we're going to be exploring new modes that branch out from standard Destiny Sandbox. Checkmate is a new set of game rules that is that intends to create a slower-paced experience where players have more opportunity to react to encounters and where power spikes are earned rather than guaranteed. This includes changes to how special ammo is acquired, ability recharge rates, weapon time to kill, and the player's health settings. This mode is a significant shift from our core experience, so we're currently targeting Season 22 to make sure we have time to tune this up. Checkmate is built as a modifier, like we build, like we use for Nightfalls, so and can be easily applied to multiple standard modes to give us maximum flexibility going forward. As we get closer to final shape, we hope to convert some of our other modes, Momentum, Mayhem, into modifiers too. I'm so excited because this sounds like 
this kind of sounds like SWAT. This basically is what I this is what I wanted momentum control to be. This basically yeah. sounds like a no abilities mode, and I'm very excited for this. Yeah. Um, this is this is a mode that a lot of us have been asking for, and that I think a lot of traditional FPS players have wanted. And it's not that I don't. I I think the abilities are what make Destiny so unique in both a PVE and PVP context. But sometimes I just want to use my guns. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to have to be just like chucking grenades and hoping for the best, or like dying to some random ass throwing knife. You know. Right. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited to see how this plays out. Yeah, this this sounds like this sounds like it's going to be whatever that you know Destiny's version of SWAT essentially. You know. Yeah, which I mean, listen, I think Momentum has has done an admirable job in that regard. Um, but it, it's it's time for us to get a full fledged mode. Yeah. It's yeah. time, Corey. It's time. It's time. No, I agree. It's time. <laughs> it's time. How are we also have a twop this week? The twop. The twop. Twop, 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 twop. So there's, there's a lot here about the mid-season uh, patch, which is just fucking wild. This is, this is like a small novel here. Uh, it's not as long as I thought, but it's it's pretty long. Um, but <laughs> we got to talk about this hot fix today first. Yeah. Um, thank God. Thank God this hot fix happened. <laughs> so what do you mean, Josh? <laughs> oh, my God. In today's update, we've reduced legend and master enemy HP scalers for non boss units, which we felt were a little higher than we liked. Reduced enemy HP scaler in all non raid or dungeon legend and master activities by 10%. Reduced the co-op enemy HP scaler and legendary Avalon by 33% in the full fire team. Let me tell you something. Jesus Let me tell Christ. you something. I ran this fucking thing this afternoon. And first off, you could noticeably tell, okay? But holy shit, we still got swarmed by so many fucking ads in that harpy room. Holy shit. The, the harpy and hydra room was just absolutely wild. We, uh... I ran it with Dealer and Joasis, and Joasis was, uh, he was doing all the puzzles. Dealer and I just pretty much posted up at Vex Portals in the first encounter, and just kept fire, just kept throwing grenades and firing LMGs and glaives into the abyss. Yeah. It was great. It was absolutely outstanding. Uh, yeah, really, really enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun. It was definitely still harder than shit, but, uh, I would recommend for anybody who has not gone and gotten their, uh, Catalyst yet for Vex Caliber, do your Legend runs now before they nerf the effect of wish ender because wish ender you can cheese the final boss with when you shoot him through his little uh shield that he's in he takes like seven or eight times the amount of damage he's supposed to yeah so yeah we were just we were annihilating him with wish ender and then in the final encounter you hide behind the vex the vex waterfall and uh, shoot him through the waterfall and it has the same effect it's mm. great it's outstanding Go do it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. We've also made reductions to commendations requirements so players can reach their milestones at a more enjoyable pace. Hawthorne's weekly co challenge commendations target has been reduced from 20 to 5. Jesus. <laughs> to 5. Hmm. Well, yeah. That is not a typo. 5. Yeah. No. <laughs> Re removed guardian rank objectives that required players to give commendations from ranks 7, 8, and 9, and further reduced commendation score requirements for ranks 7 through 9. Rank 7 is now 200, rank 8, 477, and rank 9 is 910. I don't know how they came up with these numbers, but they did. Leave it to Bungie to, to figure out the numbers. You leave, know? leave it to leave it to fucking Bungie, man. Um, some other things that uh, that were fixed: uh, Neomuna Free Room, Free Roam reduced the prevalence of uh, orange health bar enemies to lower the base difficulty of Free Roam. Thank fucking god. Fixed an issue that was causing Cabal turrets in Ashima Park to respond too quickly. Uh, <laughs> Root of Nightmares fixed an issue where Nezarak would not react to players that were positioned in a well of radiance. Let me tell you something, man. I don't think that this actually got fixed because we did a Root of Nightmares run this afternoon too, and we still almost won phase this guy. Hmm. It was wild. Um, the difficulty has been scaled for uh, Legend and Master tier Nightfalls, Battlegrounds, Lost Sectors, Offensives, Hunts, and Legend Master campaign missions. Um, just absolutely fucking wild. Um, fix an issue where the target lock trait was not correctly deactivating on a miss if the weapon was firing from 7 RP 720 RPM or higher. Um, and... Uh, yeah, those are kind of the major issues that were fixed today. 
but the rest of this squad, man, this is the rest of this is about the future, about the mid season patch, the future. <laughs> we want to see how the PVE sandbox shook out after the release of Lightfall. Not necessarily to see if primary weapons needed a buff, but how much we should buff them. We've done quite a bit of testing on these numbers and content ranging from heroic nightfalls to legendary campaigns all the way up to grandmasters. And we think the changes are impactful without invalidating the difficulty of the appropriate levels. <laughs> In heroic and legendary content, you should be more likely to one-shot red bar enemies depending on the weapon type, and even in GMs, we've shaved how many shots it takes and time it takes to kill further below weapons against red and orange bar enemies. We want to add that we do not believe that we are done with tuning weapon damage in PvE. This is a starting point. We will revisit in the coming seasons to make sure everything has a place in the sandbox. Increase the damage of the following weapon types against red and orange enemies in PvE. Auto rifles. 25% 25% more damage. Yes. Pulse rifles, hand cannons, and sidearms. 20%. Right. I absolutely love this. Uh, everybody knows I love a good pulse and a good sidearm, but uh, yeah, this is this is wild. Pulse rifles should be more in a more reasonable spot. Hand cannons should feel like they pack more of a punch, and sidearms should fall much better into the high-risk, high-reward category. Scout rifles have only been buffed 10% because, let's face it, they're already like pretty good ranged options and they said they don't want you to be able to trivialize content by just plunking away with unlimited ammo right um smgs and bows uh have not been touched uh they will continue to be kept an eye on and their tuning may be revisited as necessary yeah but they didn't didn't they just tune smgs like a couple seasons ago they did and then uh as they explain here icolos smg came along Aggressive frame SMGs have been very strong in the PvP meta for the last couple of months with a handful of outliers taking most of the credit. Icolos SMG was something of a mystery to us as we continuously felt and got reports that the gun seemed to have much better stability than its stats would indicate it should compared to other SMGs. Originally, it was built back in the Warmind era where we had fewer guidelines on how to keep weapons balanced, and upon doing a deep investigation, we found some custom tuning had been added to the weapon's scope to give it a recoil reduction effect. For comparison, the recoil reduction tuning was likely having an effect nearly equivalent to Zen Moment at maximum strength, and it was always (laughs) active. We have removed that custom tuning, and the recoil should now feel in line with other SMGs. Uh, Yeah, goddamn. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> we were aware of this change in isolation while noticeable is unlikely to put much of a dent in aggressive frame SMGs current dominance so we have a larger change to reduce the damage of, a, of the aggressive subfamily that will release alongside season 21 <clears throat> so everybody enjoy season of the immortal because it's getting nerfed on day one of season 21 <laughs> oh man Fusion rifles. Let's talk about fusion rifles for a second. Well, last touch fusion rifle shotgun had seen a big drop in effectiveness. We were concerned that rapid fire frame fusions would rise up to take their place. As such, we preemptively nerfed rapid fires pretty hard. In today's sandbox, this is less of a concern due to the renewed strength of shotguns. Following the airborne effectiveness and pellet spread changes, so we have walked back some of the damage nerf we made to rapid fires. This change will push them back to defeating all resilience levels in seven bolts and give them a decent bump to ease of use. So increased burst damage by 50 15 and damage in pve is unchanged so guess what people are about to fucking feast with cartesian coordinate and royal executioner which is the uh, craftable fusion this season go craft that some bitch if you haven't already that right. thing's about to be op as all hell <laughs> god damn uh trace rifles there's been some changes to trace rifles here um increased base damage by four percent uh reduced precision hit multiplier from 1.4 to 1.35 and increase, increase the effectiveness of stability at reducing flinch. <clears throat> sniper rifles, however. Stuck snipers. Johnny is really excited about this one. Rapid frame sniper rifles have long struggled to find a place in both PvE and PvE. In PvP, their inability to kill with two body shots puts them on uneven footing with other snipers, and in PvE, their fast RPM but standard inventory sizes mean you consistently feel low on ammo. Ammo. To address these concerns and differentiate them from other snipers, we have reduced their recoil by 50%. That means hitting crits on a boss or champion in PvE is much easier, and taking rapid follow-up shots in PvP is too. We've also increased their inventory stat by 30%, which gives a lot more rounds to play with in PvE content. Jeez. That's fucking wild. Have fun that's, with that one. Mm, that's crazy. <clears throat> Final warning, the uh, stasis sidearm can no longer uh, mark targets through Titan barricades, which it was really funny, but really infuriating. <laughs> Teraba. Oh man, Teraba's actually getting a nerf here because of aggressive SMGs. We feel like Teraba's had its time in the sun. <laughs> so, uh, oh man. 
rip. This is, this is meant that savvy players could purposely bait or take a small amount of damage, like standing in a grenade's effect, to top off the Ravenous Beast perk and have it active for a second engagement. The increased ease of access has made Ravenous Beast an outlier in today's Crucible, and we are left with the options of reducing the potency of the perk itself or trying to make its activation more difficult, and we decided to go with the latter. The reduction in energy granted from taking damage puts the onus back on the user to deal damage and shifts the balance of the perk back towards a difficult activator that justifies the reward of a potent effect. In addition, we are continuing our mission to address zoom outliers, and this felt like a good chance to reduce the zoom of Terraba back down to something more in line with other SMGs. So, <sighs> dealer, I'm sorry. I know how much you love your Terraba. It may <laughs> not be the best PvP option anymore. You might just have to go back to Glacio Chasm. Mm. <laughs> and then Revision Zero. Uh, this is specifically about four times the charm. Uh, we've made a fix so the four times the charm can continue to work while Hunter's Trace is active, but it will not be able to grant ammo until all shots have been expended. This means you can still enjoy the two free shots provided by the perk as long as you hit all four Hunter's Trace rounds without worrying about being kicked out of the mode. In addition, we have buffed the damage of all Hunter's Trace rounds by 25% in PvE, and have buffed the Hockey Heavy Burst rounds by 75% in PvE. This will now make it a, more of a trade-off when choosing between the Origin perks, either dealing more damage in the primary mode, but cha charging Hunter's Trace more slowly, or dealing less damage, but charging the bonus shots more quickly. So, that's kind of wild. And then, at <clears throat> Season 21 launch... A rework of weapon hip fire reticles to better display useful information to players. Accuracy, aim assist, charge state, exotic perk, etc. The aggressive frame SMG nerf, which I like how they've had to highlight that like six times here. Right. A 10% PvE buff to sniper damage and buffs and adjustments made to more than a, a dozen exotic weapons, including Graviton Lance and Salvation's Grip. Is Salvation's Grip actually going to be useful for something? Uh... It only took us how many years to get here, Corey? Almost three. Two, we're at two and a half right now, I think. I mean, yeah, I, I guess, but do people even care now? I mean, I, yes, I, guess, I would I guess, like for it to be useful. <laughs> look, to be fair, I would like for all weapons to be useful, but yes, it's not that was works. something that you, you used for a specific quest and it has never served a purpose otherwise. Yeah. Unfortunately. <sighs> oh, my God. <sighs> Man. And then there there's a few uh, there's some things they're going to work on with Zoom. Um, other than that, there's a nice interview here with the uh, the cinematics director um, talking about why uh, Kostov is in so many things these days, why it was in that final cut scene, and why is it uh, in the post-game screens, and he explains it's just easier for them to have that rather than have awkward animations like uh, a, holding a bow or something like a bow or a glaive or something. Yeah, um, that makes sense. That's kind of nice. Kind of gave a peek at uh, what we see in cinematics versus uh, what they see when designing it. And a truly horrifying image of Crow. Yeah. Crow's like crumpled backwards and like folded like ragdolls. It's, it's not great. <laughs> it's not great. It's kind of creepy. Uh, some great 4K wallpapers. I love that they're giving us the art from the season passes as backgrounds. Yeah. Because these are some really cool images that we've been getting, like the Anna and Rasputin one last season, this one with Mara and the Queen's Guard. Also, what's up with all of the uh <laughs> the puka the pukas giant pukas in the landscapes? Oh, so the giant pukas are from uh when Lightfall was getting ready to come out and they were like, for every retweet we make the puka bigger, and it got to like a hundred thousand retweets or something. And so eventually <laughs> they had to have it just like over the solar system, I think. That's so funny. Yeah, it was great. I, re I really there. like it. There's this one that's it's like hovering over Neptune and it's huge. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that one. Uh, I love the one where it's just it, it's such a it's such a bad Photoshop. It's just in the middle of Neomuna. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, that's great. Uh, the Vex Portal one's pretty cool. Um, the, the Brachion fight. But yeah, there, there's there's some cool ones here. Um, personally, I really like the uh, the Queen's Guard one. Yeah. I'll be uh saving that one just for uh, reference purposes for lore purposes uh, i love the close-up of the puka over uh neptune though that is uh yeah haunting so i'm gonna i'm gonna set that to be chelsea's uh wallpaper when she's asleep <laughs> she's gonna be like what the fuck <laughs> but that man that does it for the twab this is actually yeah. not a horribly long twab okay. um i wish they would add more of these wallpapers every week so i could have <laughs> good images for thumbnail <laughs> Uh, yeah, some of those are pretty great. I do. You should just just save the puka ones. Yeah, I am. I would just be like clicking save on all of these, honestly. 
Yeah, I am. This is I good. think those are they're they're great uh for like I don't know, they're great neutral ones if nothing else. Yeah. This um, I am looking forward to doing uh the master challenges in uh Root of Nightmares. Even the master challenges are easy. Dado had a screen cap, and I think he had a video of it that uh someone in his fire team had to step out to take a work call for like an hour and a half and they still finished the master raid. Mm. With nice. the challenge, and the guy was still part of the fire team the whole time. That's funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Um, oh, Corey, you, yeah. got, you got something really cool in the mail this week. I did. I So, hold on. I might, I might curse it if it breaks, but uh, I, got, I got my Varix. The loyal statue. Oh man, it looks wore my... so good, dude. It's it's like, aside from the the staff which falls apart every time I move it because it comes in two pieces. Uh, this is the best one they've done since Stranger, or since Elsie. I love that. that yeah. Well, okay, Savathun nonwithstanding. Well, yeah, but I don't have that one yet. No, two hundred and fifty dollars. Two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> but this one, I mean, this one was one hundred and fifty though. So I mean, it's it was worth it though. I mean, man, it's so cool. Like, I'm it's... a big fan. I uh, I was telling Corey before the show, I'm gonna have to probably get that in Shacks as soon as they go on sale. Yeah, I'm. I was debating on getting Shacks or not because I I have the original run of Shacks. Yeah, you have a really good looking Shacks already. Yeah, and I also have the uh, Saladin. Saladin. Yeah, okay. I regret not. Those were on the shelves for years, and I never grabbed them, and I really regret it now. Yeah, so uh, I would love yeah. a Saint fourteen like that. I know. I I'm hoping, man. I how many of these things do you think they're gonna make? You think they're just gonna keep making characters every three months? I don't know. I would say off the top of my head, there's probably one, two, three, four. There's probably at least five more that they're gonna do. I mean, I could think of like ten I would buy off the top of my head. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah, I'm not talking about ones I would buy. I just, like, I think the guaranteed ones you still do are probably Ikora, Zavala, Crow, Mithrax, The Osiris. Witness, Saint. Uh, Osiris, and Saint. So there's seven of them. Yeah. I think those are your guaranteed ones that they would still do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd I... be really surprised if they didn't make, like, Rolk eventually. Yeah. Rolk and I... Keitel, considering how, like, popular those characters have become. Yeah. I mean, look, as long as I keep making them, I will find I'm waiting to see them, which but... uh, what exotic helmet they do next. Yeah. Because I don't think I that's found... a line you can do, like, infinitely, but I think that you could still do, like, a couple more. Because they've done uh, Celestial Nighthawk, Shaxx's Helmet, and Nezirax Sin. Yeah. All three of which look awesome. Yeah. I need to get the Nez one. Yeah. They all look pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Although the, the Nezirax one went up in price recently, because probably because... Obviously, Nezarek is. Yeah, I I will probably be grabbing a Nezarek one sooner rather than later, just because of that. Yeah. Um, I, I've been only been dropping hints about it for a couple months to uh, to uh, Chelsea for my birthday. Yeah. Um, I got a bunch of seals in the mail. <laughs> finally, like all my stuff I ordered last year is finally shipping. That's crazy. Uh, I realize we're all doing a giant mail haul right now, but uh, I wow. got my stuff from uh, Haunted. <laughs> Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have more to show, Josh. So, so I got my haunted <laughs> seal finally, uh, which looks really cool. Uh, I got my dungeon pin. My duality dungeon pin finally came in. Nice. Uh, which I really, lo- I really, really love how this thing looks. Yeah, it's super cool. It looks really. I, cool. I I've come to really love the dungeon and uh, raid pins. Yeah, and I'm really happy they're doing those because, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy another raid jacket realistically. Yeah. Um. But the thing that I think I'm most jazzed about, and it's funny, I, I was joking with Corey that I was going to have to like order this in secret, but they are going to, I think starting next week, you're going to be able to order it off the Bungie website. They're going to start doing this thing from the exotic collection uh-huh. where they, uh, it's like an acrylic 3D model of the gun and it's on like a big piece of wall art and it like has the perks underneath it and stuff it very much looks like the profile out of the exotic collections book yeah yeah and the first one they're doing it with is vex caliber like god damn it 
if it was something like Dead Man's Tail or like a hand cannon, I could say no. But Vex looks so cool. I know it does. Um, I, uh... And and then right as I was like talking to you about that, uh, Chelsea had been looking at this. I think she wanted to order something for my birthday. And she was like, hey, have you seen this thing? I was like, yes, actually. <laughs> about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, so the past week I've gone as far as looking on, on Etsy for, like, 3D printed uh, versions of the weapons. And, like, I was looking at Outbreak Perfected and somebody made one with, like, lights in it. And the it's Siva like 400 actually... bucks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, uh... There's one that I've looked at a lot. Um, his uh, The store name is Metaguns. Mm-hmm. Um, and I follow them on Twitter. They made so many cool things. They made a custom uh, Thousand Voices and a Jotun. Oh wow! The Jotun was on the, is on their site for nine hundred and fifty dollars. Of course, it is. One <laughs> K is half that price. Yeah. Um, I showed those to Chelsea, and she's like, "Yeah, keep dreaming. You're not buying one of those." She's like, <laughs> "I might let you get a hand cannon or like your recluse or something, but that would be it." Yeah. She's like, "You are not spending five hundred dollars on a replica gun that has to be shipped from Siberia, and that's not an exaggeration." Yeah, this guy literally lives in Siberia. It's just like, oh my god! Like, I I would never. I don't think I could ever bring myself to spend that much money. I think like two hundred is like my limit on stuff like that. Yeah, like I have enough lightsabers in this house, and I spent. I just spent two. I spent two hundred dollars on a Nerf Gallarhorn, so that's like the most I'm comfortable with spending on like a replica gun if it looks good. Yeah, man. Those guns, though, they look good. The people that do them are doing them right. I know. Yeah, just, man, fucking hats off. It's amazing what you can do with a 3D printer. I know. Need somebody to make me a St. 14 statue. I need someone to make me all the characters that look as good. All the characters, yeah. Corey will buy a Tess Everest from you if you allow him. Yeah, I I would. I would buy a sweeper bot, too. (laughs) Okay, no, no, no lie. I'd probably get a sweeper bot. I would also buy, like, a grungy meatball. Okay. Oh, dude, can we get a can we get Oryx as a Numbskull statue? I'm kind of shocked that they didn't do Callus. Actually, I mean they did Savathun. I think Callus was probably coming. They probably didn't want because I mean they have to give them the files, and I think they probably wanted to like keep him closer to the vest until they yeah. actually put him in game. Yeah, but even great. then, like you got to do him on the throne. You can't do you can't do Shadow Legion Callus with the fucking mop bucket on his head. Uh, but you can. That would be dude. I'm, I swear to God, I'll put a brown bag over him if I buy it. I'll put a brown bag over him. What if it's Callus sitting on his bucket helmet? Oh my god, I hate you Holding so a much. chalice. Corey, we have questions tonight. <laughs> my we question. have questions from the community. Of course, if you want to submit a question, you can email us, towercasuals.gmail.com, or you can join the Discord and post in our weekly thread there. Uh, this kind of went up like last minute uh, this afternoon. Uh, yeah. Joe threw it up for us. They, but that's uh, okay, it's been a very busy week for everybody. Yeah, it's been it's been busy. But, <laughs> Josh, before we get into questions... Before okay, we get into questions... my My whole thing... With Callus, okay. I just, I just think he's the dumbest character. In oh, Destiny. dude, he he's got to be like top three, just meatheads in he's, Destiny. He's the worst. But I like, I think I hated him, and then when we did when we did Leviathan, I hated him even more. But now that he's been out of the game and we've been learning through the lore, and then he like now in this game, we hate him even more now. Him. Well, no, I hate him so much that I'm starting to love how much I hate him. Yeah. And it's it's just the best. It's like, okay, so if you had the like the the biggest three meatheads in Destiny, it has to be oh, Callus. It has to be Lakshmi too. Oh yeah. And then uh, who 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 else? Who who would be the third one to round this all out? <sighs> Like, are we just talking villains here? Or are we talking everybody? No, like big, biggest like dipshits in Destiny. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, Gaul was pretty. Dippy. I mean, Gaul was low key, like kind of smart. He just thought that he could manipulate a god. Oh well, yeah. What I about guess. what about his like Wrangler? <laughs> what was the what was his name? Oh, the consort. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the I think the consort who <laughs> you Gaul will lead us to glory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fucking yeah. like koopa trooper over here right He's oh like, my god can somebody like overlay his dialogue using the jack black bowser voice oh my gosh <laughs> open the gates 
<laughs> you just oh hear that, God. and then you see the, like the the big claw ship from the Red War just wrap around. I think ground. fucking Tanix would have to be on that list too. How many times we've killed him? Yeah, but he's persistent. He got. That's true. He is persistent. He God, is persistent. What if, what if what if you kill the witness and like out of the ashes of the witness just comes a new form of Tanix? I just I'm fucking turning it off and deleting the game. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even kidding. Where? If I have to, if I have to fight Tanix anymore, I'm turning it off and deleting it. There's your statue idea, Numbskull. You can make me a Tanix statue that comes with like all these parts that you can add and subtract from Tanix. You can change it if you want. Uh, regular Tanix, Siva Tanix, Taken Tanix, Nightmare Tanix, t- yeah. Tanix on a boat. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Oh my god! I'll buy it all. You can sell it separately. I don't care. He will, unfortunately. Uh, Joasis asks, do you think they'll ever retroactively give any of the raid exotics, such as Collective Obligation, Conditional Finality, Divinity, Eyes of Tomorrow, etc., a catalyst? And if so, do you think it'll be a challenge inside the raid similar to Vex or Touch of Malice? Um, I'm going to say yes to <laughs> all of these except Divinity. I don't think Divin- I don't think they're doing anything with Divinity. Just straight yeah. up. I think they're trying. Um, to I they've already that. nerfed Divinity. So what would the what would the catalyst be? You get it at full strength or something? I don't know. Yeah. Um. I, know. I do think that you have a better chance of getting them for collective obligation or conditional finality than any of the others. Yeah. Um. Not because they're like underwhelming or anything, but because I think they'd be like maybe not even maybe not even collective obligation. Like I feel like uh eyes and maybe conditional finality are probably the easiest to add in just because like their perks are just so straightforward yeah collective obligation has like a novel for its fucking description yeah it's true so possibly and if they do do any sort of catalyst for it it's 100 going to be a quest it'll absolutely yeah. be a quest yeah there's no way it won't be um Ronnie asks, when's the first raid episode of the podcast? That'd be a great listen for everyone. Listen, we can't do it because we'll, pro- as Nerd pointed out earlier, we would probably lose our ability to post on Spotify because just all the audio from my end would be Jesus fucking Christ mm-hmm. the entire time. It we just, it wouldn't YouTube. happen. Yeah, we, we might do it on YouTube. We have kicked around the idea before. Um, I, I won't lie. We've kicked, her, we've kicked around doing a, a raid along or a dungeon along, but, uh, yeah, no, a lot of it would just be like cursing from my end, unfortunately. So, yeah. well, I so I asked them to set up a raid for me next weekend because I haven't run it yet. And yes, I know I'm a little behind and I've been busy, but maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll we'll stream it or something. Possibly. Um, I probably will not be there, but uh, Corey can stream it with whoever is there. Yeah, that would be fun. Maybe it's like a little bonus for everybody. Yeah. Uh, Nox asked us, God, I st- Nox, I'm going to say it every week. I fucking love your name, man. Great D and D character. Mm-hmm. Uh, top three PVE primaries. Mine are Huckleberry, Wish Ender, and Funnel Web slash Callus Mini Tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to try and go non-exotic. Well, no, I lied. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go non-exotic. I'm going to go non-exotic here. And I'm going to go with guns that are currently in the game. So I'm going to say <sighs> my beloved messenger has mm. to be number one mm. uh my Icolos smg mm. and uh i'm gonna go with my enigma glaive i love that thing it's either my enigma glaive or it's i don't want to say my uh i don't want to say that it's uh what do you call it the uh the lmg that i've been using the uh oh my god i completely am blanking on the name of it the void lmg from last season um, I've been using that in all of my builds because everything is volatile right now and it's right. really fun to use. Right. Uh, it's just like unlimited heavy is everywhere. I think uh, Joe was saying earlier when we were doing Master of X between me and uh, Dealer, there were like 20 heavy bricks on the ground for him. Mm. Uh, yeah. those, those would be my picks. Yeah. Uh, so if we're avoiding exotics, because I mean, the, you, you don't have to. I was just trying to. I know, but I'm going to try to, too, just to stick with the thing. My favorite my favorite weapon in the entire game, though, is Outbreak Perfected. Yes. I, I love that weapon, but we're going to stay away from that. I like I like I like Tears of Contrition, the scout rifle from from Haunted. Yes. I I'm a big glaive guy. I actually like uh, 
the uh what's what's the one that the the big one that came out uh Kalgaroth uh, Judgment of Kalgaroth yeah yeah that one uh god I mixed <laughs> Kalgaroth Kalgaroth and <laughs> Golgaroth for some reason <laughs> I don't know and then uh everybody knows I'm a big shotgun guy I I've been flipping between uh the new the new shotgun I forget what it's called the it's the new shotgun this season that's really good oh the the Neomuna one yeah yeah yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been using it a lot too love it love it <laughs> love it um but as for exotics I've actually been using the uh shit why can't I ever remember the, anything the new auto rifle that you got for pre-ordering the game Quicksilver Quicksilver Jesus Christ yeah Quicksilver I've actually been using that a lot as well so looks like I'm going to keep using it because of the 20% 20% increase for auto rifles oh man thank god for that huh thank god for that I need all the help I can get guys mm. <laughs> oh my god one. Uh, Tiger Jesus 64 asks out of the new weapons, what has been your favorite and which has been the most disappointing? So when we say new weapons, I'm going to allow raid weapons to be included in this because selfishly I have a raid weapon answer, which is Rufus's fury. I will not be taking any more questions at this time, but that auto rifle absolutely fucks. Mm. It fucks. It's great. I'm thrilled that I am one pattern away from being able to craft that bad boy. Mm. I also got the sidearm today, so I'm very excited to try that out. But uh, if I cannot use, if I cannot include uh, that auto rifle in there, then uh, if I have to say no raid weapons, uh, I would probably say the Strand auto rifle from the uh, uh, raiding Perpetuous? activity. Yes. No. Yeah. No. No. That's the uh, that's the auto rifle from the season. Oh, um, the se- oh, you're talking about the expansion one. Yes, I'm talking about the the Niamuna SMG. Um, which again, I can never remember the name of this thing. It's two words. Uh, Hold on, I'm looking. Yeah, but I really enjoy that one um, with uh, Hatchling. It's a lot of fun. It's not as good as Immortal, but uh, I was really enjoying it. I can't say Immortal because I don't have an Immortal yet. Um, half or I'm a rank and a half away from getting it, I think. And I'm still waiting, eager, eagerly awaiting the Trace Rifle from the raid. Uh, Corey, the, what would be uh, your favorite? You're talking and about the synch- most... uh, synchronic roulette. Yes. The SMG. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, man, from the season, from the season, I really like, I really, really like the the Basso Ostinato, which is yep. the shotgun. Yeah. Love it. I agree, love especially it. if you can proc uh, volatile on that. Yeah. Uh, I really like the Season of Defiance Auto Rifle, rifle Perpetualis. Uh, I I love it. Um, I actually got a pretty good roll on it too. I forget what it is at the moment, but I got a pretty decent roll on it. So that's yeah. I've been having I've been having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, uh, and then I also I kind of like the Pulse Rifle uh, from from. Uh, the uh, pulse rifle is excellent. Yeah, I I'm I don't have a great roll on it, but I like the way it feels. No, I'm still waiting on two more patterns to be able to craft it. Yeah, so I'm gonna need to craft one at some point, but I I like the way it feels. I just want better rolls on it. So uh, I agree. Those are my three. Uh, what's your most disappointing weapon? Uh, I I hate the 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 grenade launcher. Um, Which one? Uh, the uh regnant no okay i was very say get the fuck out of here if regnant is disappointing hold on i got i got to look it up it's not that um the uh shit the which one is it the uh i can't find it i can't find it the uh shit where is it not Regnant. It's not Regnant. It's the other one, the, the breech loader one. Oh yeah, I, I know which one you're talking about. That one, I hate it. Um, what is it? Prodigal Return? Is that what it's called? I think so. Yeah. Um, my most disappointing is an exotic. Um, it's the it's the stasis sidearm. Mm. Um, it's good in like certain situations. It's hella fun in PVE. I think to just like clown on some red bars, but. It's definitely not the smart pistol I was hoping for. 
Yeah. Um, I think with like a buff or two, this, I mean, with the 20% buff, this actually could be really good. Yeah. Um, but right now that's, that's on the list. Um, just, I, I think with the sidearm though, I think making an exotic sidearm is extremely difficult. I think you after know, devil's it, ruin, it was it always going to be hard again. Yeah. Cause devil's ruin is just so unique. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, we, we went through a period there where we got so many good sidearms in like a two year span with Devil's Ruin, Traveler's Chosen, Trespasser. Um, well, not just that, but even even the legendary ones, the uh, yeah, the, the uh, Iron Banner one from a couple like from a year ago. Oh, dude, Fool's Remedy fucking slaps. I love Fool's Remedy. So, um, yeah, and I mean, I've been very open about my love for Breachlight from Season of the Dawn mm-hmm. and uh, Last Hope, which we've gotten a couple times in game, and I'm still eagerly awaiting one more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that or the uh, the Neomuna fusion. Those are those are my probably my two most disappointing. Yeah, I don't really like the fusion rifle either. I'm not a huge fusion rifle guy though, so mm-hmm. it's always hard for me to judge those because I don't use them all that often. I, I would say that too. Um, I've been trying to get more into using them though. Yeah. Um, Zao asks us. Uh, he has two questions. His first question. Uh, I posted this in the Discord, but I had a thought and wanted your opinion on it. What's your thoughts if they added double spoils weekends for raids? Similar to how other games have double XP weekends, we already have infamy, valor, uh, trials, etc. I think uh, you should I th- I think you should do that for a raid that's not the pinnacle, so it would encourage you to do the other raids even when they're not in rotation. I w- I would agree. I think if they set a certain raid to mm-hmm. be uh double spoils, mm-hmm. then that would be fine. I think it gets very tricky when it's something that you can go in and just farm certain encounters, uh, such as running the Templar, which takes 90 seconds. Right. Um, well, maybe, or... maybe you don't make it farmable. Maybe that's the, the, that maybe that's the swing. You don't. Yeah. Like so it. like personally, I would like to see this conceptually. I don't know how you implement this without, cause I think part of the appeal to it is farmability. And I think like spoils are already so farmable on some of these encounters. Mm-hmm. Um, such as, I mean, like Deepstone has ones you can do in like 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, this raid, uh, yeah, Root of Nightmares is going to have that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Root of Nightmares already has that. There's some that you can do on uh, some of these other ones. You know, I, I mentioned Templar. You know, Templar is a 90 second in and out. Right. Um, it's the quickest farm in the game, always has been. Um, so I don't know with them doing it to where... They have the rotating pinnacle raids now. I don't necessarily know if I would like this. Mm-hmm. If they did, it would likely just double from three to six. Uh-huh. Um, I what mean, if, if you did added, it on... Go ahead. What if they added double pinnacles to specific encounters if you did the challenge? Associated? So they already do. I mean, they already do that. Oh, do they? Yeah. If you go and do... Like, if I were to go in there right now and do the master route of nightmares and I do the challenge on the first encounter... You get two chests out of that. Okay. When you complete the challenges, you get a second chest, and that weapon does drop at that level. I want so, to note that that was my idea, and Bungie took it from me. It's been there for quite a while. <laughs> we were fighting that when we were doing uh, we were doing the deep star deep stone farm last season. We were fine, or right before uh, Lightfall came out, we were finding that out. We were uh, going through and doing the Atrex. Uh, we were doing the Atrex challenges, and we were getting uh, double chests out of it all the time. So. It is pretty good. Um, I, I I don't know. That would have to be something that I think that like Bungie would have to take a lot of care with doing it because either way you're going to make a group of people really mad. Um, I think that the, the what they have right now I think is okay. I just think maybe if it was like, oh, it's a farmable raid, maybe you bump it up to giving the full five spoils and like that can be your farm. Um, I think that could be a change you could do that would like kind of keep the balance a little bit. So like, oh, the people who go and engage with it are getting more spoils than they normally would. But, you know, that plus if you do the challenges, you're getting the extra drops. I think that would be a fair compromise. Yeah. Uh, and then he asks uh, one non-Destiny related question, if I can get my phone to unlock. Um, Non-Destiny related question. What's your guilty pleasure game to play? Oh, man, Josh. Oh, man. Right now? Right now? It's Disney Dreamlight Valley. God, Corey was way too excited to answer. Yeah, this question. it was. Guess what, Josh? Lion King dropping on April fifth. Hmm. I'm gonna be honest. I haven't touched Dreamlight Valley since like two weeks after launch. I mean, that's fine. But 
uh yeah man disney dreamlight valley right now man disney dreamlight valley dude every night every night before i go to bed i pop that thing in for like a half hour just lay there and farm some crops and sell them to goofy and plant more so i can build up my ta- my little town you know oh my lord also i'm stuck in the olaf quest and i don't feel like finding his arms because i don't want to so that's, he's just that's fair. He's, he's stuck in this dark cave with no arms i uh i play a lot of puzzle games in my spare time um i really love puzzle games uh not necessarily tetris but uh back in the day i played a lot of meteos on the ds uh, on my PSP, I think I wore out my uh, UMD disc of Luminous, and I definitely did not buy a Vita just for Luminous Electronic Symphony. Mm, nope. But I That's might not have. really guilty pleasure, though. That game's good. I mean, okay, so um, this is all kind of like leading up to my ultimate guilty pleasure, which is playing Bejeweled on my phone. Mm. I play a lot of Bejeweled on my phone. I'm on like level 1300 or something. Mm. I played I a play... lot of Disney Emoji Blitz for a while. I play a lot of Bejeweled. Um, that is straight up my guilty pleasure. I go in and like do dailies and shit. Uh, I play a lot of that. I don't really have like. I wouldn't say I have like other guilty pleasures like that are like recurring games. I mean, like we all have guilty pleasures of like games that aren't that good, but we still love. Mm-hmm. And I feel like nine out of ten times it's like a Nintendo game. But mm-hmm. for a while there, I think a lot of people would have answered Animal Crossing. Josh, if you ask Nintendo fans, every Nintendo game's good. Yeah, I know. I, I've met Ed. Um, <laughs> I yeah, no, I, I just Bob Lock every Wednesday, guys. If you <laughs> Nintendo Bob Lock. Um, <laughs> I don't have a lot that I like really like though. Uh, honestly, like games that I would consider guilty pleasures, just because I don't have time anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm playing something, it's because I think it's worth my time. Yeah, it's gotta be. It's gotta be good. So yeah, if it's if it's a game on my phone, if it's a game on my phone, it's it's a guilty pleasure. Uh, yeah it's fair uh, um and then uh ronnie asks last question of the night ronnie asks what is your least favorite type of weapon to use bows bows snipers anything anything no, long range snipers are infinitely better to use than bows but oh, i yeah. fucking hate bows i like them for about three minutes in forsaken and i have refused to use them ever since you know what i like them when i need to complete a bounty and i go to the gosmodrome and nope. shoot like 10 no nope. can't even be bothered can't be bothered uh, let me tell you something i busted out wish ender today and it's the first time i've used a bow in probably a year at least mm, bows, bows at least worst. i fucking oh. hate bows i, I fucking I hate also them. i also don't like breach loaded grenade launchers either i don't like not a either. fan of those either because they usually fly back in my face yeah i or kill myself with those a lot around. i'm very bad with them and that's why i don't like them bows i just don't like <laughs> i just don't like them they were so underpowered for so long, and I just can't get that perception out of my head. I recognize that they're good. I was cackling like a madman using Wish Ender when it was so fucking busted today. But uh, yeah, I overall do not care for it at all. Pass. Pass. Mega pass. Can't do it. Purple pass. Ugh, can't do it. Well, Corey, what do you say we go to the lore corner? Let's do some lore corner, Josh. Let's do lore corner. Let's do some lore corner. Uh, the first one is going to be for uh, the Vanguard sidearm that's up this week. An old returning weapon, Buzzard. Oh. Gun sucked ass when it first came out. I hope it's a little bit better now. Doubt it. <laughs> Doubt it. Doubt it, but uh, I'll find out. Uh, <laughs> I'll allow it. <clears throat> this is foolish, Mithrax says. Empty hands spread. The Trostland Forest had been quiet until three Elixni jumped from their hiding places with weapons sparkling with arc energy. Two dregs and a vandal. They bear House Salvation's sigil. Misrax the Forsaken, one dreg clicks, brandishing a spear. Come to kill us? No, he says, staring them down. I will not harm you. You lie like a human. Mithrax sees the shift of the spear in the dreg's hands the moment before he lunges. The kel avoids its thrust and grips the dreg by its head, slamming it into the ground with a hard crack. The vandal draws a sidearm. Mithrax rushes him, grabs him by the waist, and wrenches the gun upward. The vandal's lower hand jabs a knife in the soft flesh between Mithrax's carapace. He barely sure. feels it. Yeah. Um, that's that's what we're going with. He barely feels it. The Kell of Light puts a hand around his attacker's throat and squeezes the life from him. The third flees, and Mithrax lets him. The Kell pulls the knife from his side and drops it among the pine needles, pressing a hand to his wound. Perhaps when all the violence was done, the future he could give the Elixir would be worth it. 
would justify everything he had done, every death, every act of cruelty or kindness or love. He knows that Aram has hoped for the same. For now, Mithrax can only lead the two Elixni where they lie. He'll come back later for their funeral rites. And this is this is important for us to understand where Mithrax comes from. You know, we we've had the dialogue, you know, the survivor's epitaph. We we talk about a lot on here. And this season, I think we've seen not necessarily a different side of Mithrax, but just like you're starting to see the exasperation and like almost the desperation in a lot of ways. Like it feels like his storyline is coming to a head to the point where I genuinely thought he was going to be the one to die instead of Amanda. Cause I was like, Amanda's too obvious, but having the Aramis dialogue was very much, I felt a red herring yeah. um, afterwards, but it was, you know, very revealing that Aramis still saved Mithrax. She could have easily let him die there and she chose to save him. Um, I think because, Deep down in her heart, I think she's regretting the choices she's made, and she knows that Mithrax is supposed to be the Kel of Kelts, even if he wants... He keeps running from the destiny. Instead of running towards it, he runs away from it, and that's kind of what suits him perfectly for it. You know, we see it here. He doesn't actually want to fight these guys, but they're going to try to kill him anyways, right. and he's going to beat the shit out of you. Yeah. <laughs> he he just straight up is, like... We're, I would be shocked if we got to the end of the story and, you know, Mithrax wasn't only a guardian, but if he's not the Kel of Kells, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the prophecy, I think the prophecy has to be fulfilled and we see in things like this, like Mithrax is a character, you know, for so long, the Elixni or, you know, as we've called them for most of the game, the Fallen, haven't really been compassionate characters. Varix even, Varix is not a very compassionate guy. He's just kind of there and he's less hostile towards us than the rest. It wasn't until we met Mithrax that was like, oh shit, like there's actually like some sympathy to be had here, mm-hmm. I think, you know, yeah. and you know, you start learning about the history of, you know, the Elixni people and the whirlwind and everything else. And you're like, well, shit, these, these guys have been through a lot. They're just trying to survive ultimately. Yeah. And you still get this sense, you know, from beyond light onwards that Mithrax is the one guy who can unite these people that can unite the rest of the race. They're yeah. almost extinct. Yeah. I feel like I almost feel like Aramis and stick with me here. I feel yeah. like I feel like Aramis is almost like a Kylo Ren style character almost. Yes. Where like I would agree with know, that. She's like wanting to wanting something more and she feels like she has to be evil to do it, but also she's feeling the drawback to be <laughs> I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength. Yeah. Yeah. Is she also going to kill Han Solo? Maybe. Spoilers. <laughs> I mean, if you haven't been spoiled on that yet, I don't know what to tell you. So, yeah, I um, no, but, great. I mean, great I wonder. Stuff, I wonder stuff. if her. I wonder if her Mithrax are gonna, you know, kiss at the end and then she dies. Aramis is a lesbian. Well, it doesn't mean anything. Aramis is a lesbian, Corey. We went to college once. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, ecliptic distaff. <laughs> Uh-huh. Mara stood at the farm, her body a glowing conduit of energy. Power st- steamed, uh, streamed care- ceaselessly. God damn. I'm starting over. Mara stood at the farm, her body a glowing conduit of energy. Power streamed care- ceaselessly from her palms upward and outward. She gradually became aware of the bleary figure standing before her. Yes, Petra, she croaked. Her throat was hoarse. The figure shook its head. I'm afraid you can't keep this up forever, said Devrim gently. Devrim. Mara thought, of course. She had sent Petra back to the Dreaming City hours ago. No, yesterday. Had it been yesterday? Do not presume to, Mara began, but somewhere in the EDZ, a titan lowered her armored shoulder and charged into a group of Shadow Legion, and Mara sent her the power she needed. Elsewhere, a hunter teased a fistful of emerald strings from nothing that surrounded him and swung across a gap in the Ascendant Plane, and Mara strained to guide his feet firmly to the other side. Mara felt something brush against her mouth and opened her eyes. A Techian attendant stood on her tiptoes, holding a canteen to the queen's lips. She drank. If I may, ma'am, Devram said, I know what pushing yourself too hard looks like, and right now it looks like you. Something in Devram's voice touched Mara, and the flow of power faded as she let her hands drop to her sides. She accepted the canteen, took another long drink, and handed it back to the Techian with a grateful nod. She met Devram's concerned gaze and took a deep breath. I said I would assist, she said. Mara closed her eyes, spread her shaking hands, and sent her energy streaking skyward once again. Can we talk about 
the radical character changes that Mara has undergone since not only Aldrin's death, but his resurrection. Right. Yeah. That's I mean, like low key. I think one of the like most unsung storylines or like character developments in Destiny currently is yeah. how much Mara has changed even since the beginning of Season of the Lost. Yeah. Nobody's nobody's talking about it. Um, I think nobody's talking about it because we didn't really have like a whole lot of concrete evidence for it until now. You know, she showed her concern for Crow during that season. She was furious that Savathun, you know, revealed to him his past and this and that. She wanted her brother back, and she realized that all the wanting in the world was never going to bring him back. To the point where, you know, you listen to some of the messages in the helm last season, and she was comforting Anna. You know, she's comforting Anna and, you know, telling Elsie, you know, you got to be there for her. You know, you mm-hmm. still have your family. You got to be there for her. You know, I basically, like, do what I'm not able to do for mine. And there's another good piece of lore where Aldrin, can, or not Aldrin, where Crow can feel Mara's presence when uh, him and Glint are in the Ascendant Plane. I think it's the Ascendant Plane or something. He goes, you know, is there somebody else here with us? He goes, no. And uh, Glint's like, what do you think? And he's like, oh, well, it's just you, me, and Mara. Like, he's just kind of acknowledged that she's there. There's there's some dialogue at the stations this season where she's talking to him. And, you know, he's like, she basically says, you know, she's grieving for Amanda. And he's like, oh, you mean like you grieved for me? And she was like, yeah. I know what you're going through. Like, I'm well aware of what you're feeling, you know? We forget that this is now technically twice that she's lost her brother, you know? Uh-huh. they There was the original creation of the Awoken, you know? And then there was them coming back. And she disappeared, so he lost her. And then when she came, by the time she got back, he was dead. Whether by our hand or Petra's. And that's never really been clarified who actually killed Aldrin. But it's strongly indicated in the lore that we pulled the trigger. And, you know, she kind of had to come to terms with it and lost. Like, you know, we see a lot a lot of the storyline in Lost is her coming to terms with, you know, his resurrection as a guardian. The thing that she detests the guardian so much. And except for the guardian, she doesn't really trust anyone other than us and Eris when it comes yeah. to guardians. Yeah. And now you see her risking her life to save everyone she's kind of realized i think like it's time for her part it's time for her to play her part she sat on the sidelines for so long i think savathun outsmarting her made her go shit i gotta get off my ass and do something and this is how she can do it i granted she probably waited too long but it's such a powerful image to see her in the helm with everybody else yeah at the beginning of Lightfall. And then oh, yeah. for her to have such a big part in the season, and I suspect she'll have a big part in the seasons going forward this year. Oh uh, yeah, I I think so. You think I, you think she's gonna you think she's gonna die? Um they weren't so here's here's my problem with that. I would have said yes, but they've done we've had enough fake outs at this point. Right. And if they do, if they do kill off Mara, I would hope that a character as monumentally important to the franchise as Mara Sav, someone who's literally been with us since midway through the Destiny One campaign, Vanilla D One, I would hope that her death would come, if it comes, would come in an expansion and not in a season. I think killing a character like that off, like Amanda killing her off in a season, sure, she's been with us since the beginning, but how much story relevance has she really had? Yeah, she's just a familiar face. Yeah, but. I would hope that you would keep the death of a major character to an expansion. Um, and if her, I mean, I could see in a weird way, if her death brings around the end of the curse of the dreaming city. Yeah. Um, I still think that she has a part to play in this past the light and dark saga. I almost wonder if the distributary is going to be part of what we tackle with the next expansion. Yeah. Um, I would really like to see something done with that, with the remainder of the awoken forces that are still living inside the distributor we know sabathun was trying to get in there for some reason yeah and we've never quite figured out why so i would really love to know like what's going on with that we haven't had any distributary lore in years and years now i think since forsaken itself right so i'd really like to have a little bit more there a little bit more knowledge yeah (laughs) but i think that's gonna do our lore corner Corey. it is you know josh i think it's gonna do the show i think it's gonna do the show too yeah well, uh, wasn't the same without you, Josh. I'm, no. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're starting to feel, glad to be back. feel 
you know, on the right track. And, uh, you know, season of defiance story over. The See story is over. Amanda has a grave with a mm-hmm. D one gunship on it. Yeah. In the middle of the woods. That, that was the only thing was like, that's so that's just kind of like a weird place to put that. I kind of feel like they're going to migrate that to the tower when the farm yeah. gets sunset again. Yeah. So, but anyways, Josh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And I appreciate everybody that listens to tower casuals, the destiny podcast. You can find new episodes every Friday on your podcast service of choice and on YouTube. Josh, where can we find you? Uh, for right now, Twitter at Josh underscore Finn. See how that one goes for how much longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you can find me in the discord, of course, as Finn. I'm hanging out in there every day now at this point. That's become the bane of my, or not the bane, the bulk of my social media has been discord at this point. Join the discord. Join the discord. Um, we love it there. Yeah. You can also follow me on social media at I am Corey in HD. You can also find me in the discord. You can follow tower casuals at tower casuals on social media while it still exists apparently um we'll see <laughs> we'll see what happens yeah we'll see what changes come on uh, april the 15th <laughs> yeah jeez uh anyways don't worry discord will still be there we'll be yep. there we'll be there for you when you are sad and alone because you can't angry tweet at elon anymore we'll be there we'll be there i want to thank everybody for watching and or listening until next time we love you Goodbye.